into this. All right, there is the robotic voice. Good, ev good evening, everyone. It's, it's so good to be with you this evening. Bishop, thank you for the invitation to, to speak this evening. Um, and I'm, I'm entitling this presentation, The Church's Year of Grace. Uh, and I need to own up front that I am completely cribbing that from a German Catholic priest uh, uh, of many years ago, who at the time that the church throughout the world, Roman Catholic and Protestant, was rediscovering the riches of the church year, wrote uh, a five volume set called The Church's Year of Grace. But it, his, his theses really spoke to me and, and it underlined what I wanted to introduce us to in tonight's discussion. So just as soon as I asked you to, to, you were asked to mute, I'm going to ask you to unmute for one second, or actually don't. I'm going to invite you to open your chat box, and I'm going to show you a picture of my present parish, St. Paul's Church in Walla Walla. This is a picture that was taken, if you look carefully at the hymn board, on Pentecost Sunday of 1989. Um, and in your chat, I would love for you to tell me what you notice about the picture. What's right with it? What's wrong with it? If the answer is that the furniture is moved, yes, I know it's moved. It actually happened between 1989 and now. But in the chat, if you notice anything that's strange or catches your eye as relates to the church here in this photo, I want you to name it. All right, the frontal, the frontal is, is green, red for Pentecost. Yeah. Why is the altar color wrong? Why is there a flag next to the altar? I will take the first question and, and ignore the second. All right, so this is a really interesting photo. And, and for years at St. Paul's, they kept this blue frontal, that the photo may not have, have looked right. They kept this blue frontal on the altar all year long. And then they changed the pulpit fall and the lectern colors. But I wanna notice that immediately, that's where our attention went. But the funny thing is, there I tricked you in this question. There is nothing wrong in this photo. The Book of Common Prayer actually doesn't say anything at all about liturgical colors. And in fact, uh, centuries ago in England, it was customary to use your best colors on big feasts. So if your best set of vestments happened to be colored black and it was Easter, well, break out the black vestments for Easter because it's the best. Uh, we don't generally follow that anymore, but it also speaks a little bit, I think, to our experience of the church year, which is to say that we often experience the church year in terms of its artifacts rather than its, its essence. Um, probably in many of your churches, you've got a calendar like this one hanging in the sacristy, the, the church year guide, and it is, it is our guide of what colors to put up. And if you look on the back of the page, what lessons to read. Um, but those are both artifacts of those seasons, right? They're, they're things we do because it's Advent, because it's Lent, but they aren't getting to the core of the meaning of those seasons themselves. Our experience, even in our godly playrooms, comes down to that little round calendar that we see and advance week by week by week, as I know they do in the classroom here. But I want to note and propose a theme for the night, which is this. Um, our liturgical year, our church year, it, it of course follows the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it also tells our story too, right? Now, I, I firmly believe that to be a Christian means that we dive into the story of God's grace over and over and over again. And we dive into it because it's made visible in Jesus. It's been made real in our lives. But grace is not just something that we recognize as an artifact out there in the universe. It's also something we experience for ourselves. And I think that the church year is something that is experienced just as much as it is practiced, right? In the themes that we uh, undergo over the course of a year, we rejoice and live and breathe in this experience of receiving God's grace over and over and over again in different ways. We go from emotional highs to emotional lows, and we find that the church year and even the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, they mimic the ups and downs of our own lives. They mark the places in our lives that we feel close to and far from God. They help keep us human. So the church year is a lot more than just colors. 
It's a lot more than the hymns that we sing or the liturgical artifacts that we associate with it. It's, it's actually a tracing of the contours of our lives. So we are about to embark on the first great cycle of the church year that runs from Advent to the season after Epiphany. Um, you can even say to Candlemas if you're a liturgical purist, that's in February. Um, this first great cycle of the church year, and one of the, the, the things that I, a quote that I love most comes from the great preacher Fleming Rutledge, who says that Advent begins in the dark. I mean, you only need to look outside your window right now to know it's literally true. Uh, the sun is setting at 4 p.m. The days are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. It's not even Advent yet, and the readings in our lectionary have been taking on a darker tone, a more apocalyptic tone, as we look to the future. And then when we get to that first week of Advent, boy, you know, we are going to hear about the sun being darkened and the sky not giving its light. And Advent begins in darkness. It begins in, in, in the, this note of judgment. Uh, it, it, it begins with real tension that I don't think we like to feel, right? Advent is a season of final things. And boy, we don't like to talk about final things, right? Um, our biblical texts have already started turning towards death and judgment and heaven and, and hell. You know, you brood of vipers, who taught you to flee from the wrath that is to come, John the Baptist says. But we have to go into that darkness. We, we have to go into the reality of our world as it is, standing in need of judgment, standing in need of redemption. Because Advent brings us face to face and prepares us for the reality that we needed a savior once in the fullness of time, gosh darn it, we need it still. You know, we only need to look at the world around us now, and, and we can see so much that's in need of redemption, right? And with that in Advent, it also comes the promise of God's justice and righteousness in a world that doesn't reflect it. Advent takes us to the dark, but it doesn't leave us there. You know, Mary's song, the Magnificat, which we'll have on the fourth Sunday of Advent this year, it speaks of a world where God casts down the powerful from their thrones and lifts up the lowly. The, the order of things, the, the things that challenge us in the places where we lie, it is not going to remain that way, that there is always a savior. We begin in the dark. We begin in the apocalyptic. We begin with a little bit of nerves that we don't like, but we are brought out week by week into the reality that God keeps God's promises. And suddenly, we find ourselves drawn into Christmas. Now, I've got a quote here. It's always good to look to the interior verses of the hymns that we sing in church. And this one actually comes from a little town of Bethlehem by Phillips Brooks. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. You know, at Christmas, we now experience, having gone into the dark of Advent, that God comes for all of God's people. We're not left waiting forever for salvation, for justice, for righteousness, for God to come and judge the world and set it to rights. Well, God does that and enters into the world as this, this helpless child in the stable in Bethlehem. God keeps God's promises kept throughout time. And God doesn't send a prophet or an angel or someone else to save us. God sends us God in God's fullness, right? Christmas is all about the incarnation, all about the reality that God doesn't just appear as a symbol. God appears in God's fullness. Paul talked about that in his letter to the Colossians, saying that in him all the fullness of God was pleased to, to dwell when we look at Jesus, little baby Jesus lying in the crib, we're not just looking at this nice Hallmark picture scene. We're looking at God coming into the most unlikely places of this world, setting the record straight, setting things to rights bit by bit by bit. You know, we are, we're taking that Advent world of darkness and we are, the light is entering into it and raising it to new and unexpected places. Jesus is all of God, and Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. So we, we dwell in this reality that 
not only is the world as it is now longing for redemption, it is also at once redeemed by this incredible act of the incarnation. But we last in Christmas for 12 days, of course, and then we move into the epiphany season. And I want to note that epiphany is about far more than magi coming to the cradle. In fact, in another interior of verse of a hymn that we sing a lot, Jesus is proclaimed as prophet, priest, and king supreme. Epiphany is all about seeing Jesus for who he is and the circle being drawn ever and ever wider. Epiphany is all about God being seen to all. And we can think about the parts in our lives where we have needed to see God or someone has manifested God to us. The old 1662 Book of Common Prayer had loved to have nice long names for feasts and seasons. And it said that Epiphany was the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles. Even in 1662, they could see that the story here was that God is revealing God's transformative and saving power to more and more people, to wider and wider circles. And through stories like the transfiguration, the baptism of Jesus, the wedding at Cana, we see that God's power is intended to be made visible to all, that God's transformative love is to be visible to all, and the experience of grace is to be there for all people. As we also know, there's a second anchor in the church year, and that's, that's that time from Lent to Pentecost. Yes, I'm skipping over Green Sundays, and we'll come back to that. And yes, I just defied my original thesis about color is not being relevant, but I don't know a better way to refer to it very quickly. But in this time from Lent to Pentecost, we are also echoing again those same things, but entering into them in a new way. The rule of St. Benedict says that the life of a monk ought to be a continuous Lent, but then he follows up right away saying, few have the strength for this. Well, he's right. I don't know all of us are prepared for 52 weeks of Lent a year. But he says that the entire purpose is to keep its manner of life most pure and wash away in this holy season the negligences of other times. Lent brings us face to face with the realities of human life as it is. We don't like to acknowledge our sinfulness as human beings because we often view it as a failure of will. And if there's one thing our society merits, it's strong will and pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. But this idea of sin and original sin, it's not snakes in trees, it's a reality of what it is to be human, right? We're not perfect. Uh, we will fall short no matter what. Perfection is not within our grasp and that's okay. That's why we begin with Ash Wednesday and remember you are dust and to dust you shall return. All of Lent is about getting back to basics, allowing God to be God and us to be human and understanding that that is okay. If you think about the stories we read during Lent, very often they're very intimidating. And we do often look at them with the lesson of, well, Jesus did that, so we should do that too. The first Sunday in Lent, we almost always hear about Jesus's temptation in the desert. But I don't think it's there to say, well, Jesus made it through the desert, so you should too. It's a reminder that we need a savior, that we are not God, that we can't meet that test, but God can. And with God, we can, but not by ourselves. In another year, we hear the covenants of the Hebrew scriptures repeated over and over and over again. And with that, because it's Lent, we're reminded of all the times we fall short. But yet again, over and over and over again, we see that God is faithful no matter what, just as we are, in spite of what it is to be human, not because of our merit or our perfection. We ask for new and contrite hearts because when we create that new space by being really human, we, allow our, we stop putting ourselves in the place of God. And then as we move into Holy Week, this really special time between Lent and Easter, in the sacred triduum of Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and the Great Vigil, we get this moment where we really experience grace firsthand. We have our most experiential liturgies of the year, but they're diving into the incredible nature of the Paschal mystery, that Christ has died, that Christ has risen, 
and Christ will come again. It's a real demonstration of God for us. To participate in the liturgies of Holy Week is to have an experience of grace. Our Palm Sunday hosannas show God leading us, drawing our praise, and even the stones drawing praise or praising God if we weren't able to shout out. On Monday, Thursday, we see God take on the form of a servant and serve us as flawed as we are. And likewise here that if we love Jesus and if we are to be called his disciples, we too must serve others. And then on Good Friday, we see a God who comes and saves us, who lays down God's own life for the sake of those who God has called friends. We see this moment where God suddenly takes on all of what it is to be human, including death itself. That there's no place of our humanity that God will not go, will not dwell, will not walk with us. And then, of course, we're drawn into the light of Easter. All of our Lenten preparation, all of our reality, the reality of our sinfulness, all of our estrangement from God is wiped clean in the bright light of the resurrection and understanding there's something greater still prepared for us. If we've been united with him in a death like his, Paul says, we'll be reunited, we will be united with him in a resurrection like his. God defeats death that we can live to God. And we see in the Easter season, and we hear over and over and over again about how Jesus keeps appearing to his disciples, even when everything seems lost and beyond redemption. He's known to them in the breaking of the bread. He comes to Thomas as many times as it takes for him to see that Jesus is risen. He invites people to full and abundant life. He prepares the disciples for the reality that he will not always be with him, and prepares them to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth after the ascension. He promises over and over and over that we will not be alone. And we hear the story of Acts where the gospel grows wider, drawing more people and more people and more people into the transformative power of God's love. And of course, that cycle ends with the day of Pentecost when we hear the incredible story of tongues of fire lighting on the disciples, giving them power they never could have imagined themselves to have, empowering the church to do the work that we are called to do. Eucharistic Prayer D says that the Holy Spirit is God's first gift for those who believe. And at this point, having made the major journey of the church, you know, we're not left alone as disciples, but empowered to live through the Holy, by the Holy Spirit's grace throughout ages, all ages to do what we are called to do. And then I mentioned there's ordinary time, these green seasons after Epiphany and after Pentecost. That's where we live our lives. It's, there's nothing ordinary about it for having experienced the, the incredible nature of our redemption and the incarnation at Christmas, the incredible uh, nature of being loved sinners in Lent and risen and resurrected sinners in Easter. In ordinary time, we live our lives in light of those realities that we experience. It's nothing ordinary about it. It's the place where God acts. It's the place where redemption is lived day by day. And it's the place where we wrestle with our calls to be disciples. It's not the boring part of the church year. It's the canvas of our lives that we live each and every day. So I would argue that the church here doesn't just tell Jesus' story, it speaks to the Christian hope in our lives. Advent themes of judgment, of death, of heaven and hell, they're familiar realities that we all encounter but never want to talk about. And just as Advent reminds us that we need a savior, Christmas tells us that we will be saved. In the economy of salvation, nothing is ever lost, and God will find us in the furthest reaches of our lives. And in response to that, we then see that we have a call to make Christ visible, just as Christ made himself manifest to the whole world as he was here on earth. When we go through the Lenten cycle, we're reminded again and again that we're human, and yet we're reminded that we're loved. We're reminded that when we let God be God, we find that we are flung from our graves in a burst of Easter light. And we're reminded that we're never alone through Pentecost. The Holy Spirit guides our work, gives us what we need to do in our lives. 
to do the work that God calls us to do. This year, the year, the church's year of grace echoes our lives. We all have Advent and Lent moments. We all have Easter and Christmas moments, and we have those moments in between that are ordinary time, if you will. And we do this so that we can live more fully into Jesus' story. And the cycle never ends. We begin again and again and again, each year anew, each year taking something new for our lives. That we can follow Jesus more carefully or more, more closely and more fully. So I want you to break out into your small groups to talk about your experience of the church year, not just the colors or the Advent wreath or your Lenten, uh, the things you give up for Lent, but do you agree that the church year is not just telling the story of Jesus, but also mirrors the journey of your life? Where have you found that to be true? Or maybe you haven't been found that to be true. Why or why not? And what season of the church year can you most fully identify with? Don't be afraid if you're an Advent or Lent person. That's just fine. Don't, do you think your answer to this question has changed over your life? Where do you find grace and food in the church's year of grace? Those are your questions for a small group discussion. I think we said we were going to give you about 10 minutes. Is that right? Yes, that's correct, David. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. And I look forward to talking more with you when we come back into back into the large group in just a minute. All right, I'm just getting these set up here. You get these questions into the chat. Oh, yes. Are you doing that, David? I just did it. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. My 